Good evening, everybody. How are you? We are so glad to have you guys here this evening. So we're going to start right on time. People who know me are well aware that I'm kind of a fanatic about starting and ending on time. We have a lot to cover. We're thrilled that you're here. We want to maximize the value for everybody who's in this room. So my name is Nancy Burns. I've been the coordinator of the Upper Merrimack Valley Medical Reserve Corps since it started, um, 2004. And uh, you probably saw our exhibit outside because we had a lot of volunteers, several people wearing the gray shirts. Uh, any MRC volunteers want to raise their hands? You may or may not be wearing the uniform. Yep, love to see you. So um, I cannot thank each of you enough. I'd like to draw your attention first to our wonderful teen volunteers. Let's give it up for our teens. <laughs> I mean, that's part of why we're here, right? Now, if anybody had the option, how many of you would go back to being a teenager? <laughs> for the record, I didn't see any hands raised, all right? But we're here for kind of a serious, well, of course, it's a serious subject. It gets heavy at times. We always know it's hard to be a kid anyway, but especially nowadays with the kind of challenges that people are getting. Um, the reason that we have these wonderful teenage volunteers, we have a group of them doing the child care. And these four gals are going to be offering you, we want to make sure everybody gets an index card and one of those golf pencils. We also want to make sure that every single person has an evaluation and fills it out. Now, the reason they're going to be giving you cards, you can start handing them out now. Take more than one if you wish. We've got 500 of them. Because if you've noticed in your program, all of the speakers get just a half an hour to make the best use of that time. We're not allowing questions during the presentation, but we strongly encourage you to write down your question on the index cards. And then between speakers, flag down the teenagers. They'll take the um, baskets. They'll take your index cards. And we'll give them to the speakers so they'll have a few minutes before the Q&A to actually think through their answers, especially if they have three or four people all asking the same question, they could formulate it, okay? I'd like to draw your um, attention to your program. Oh, help me remember also, this is a good time to put your cell phones on stun. We don't want it going off in the middle of a really tough uh, discussion, do we? I wanted to set a good example by going first, okay? And where's my program in here? Okay. Okay. So I won't go into a lot of detail about our speakers, but I would like to briefly introduce them. First of all, Dr. Dan Rosa from Chelmsford High School. We realize that we've both been so busy, but especially Dr. Rosa, we didn't even have a conversation before tonight. Since April 17, it's just been voicemail, voicemail, email, email, but he's very quick in responding. And then I found out not only is he working as a counselor in the school, he's going from there to work late nights in a private practice. When I found out the dedication, the hours, the effort this guy puts in, you will be hard pressed to find a harder working, more dedicated human being for on behalf of our kids and family, so thank you for being here. <laughs> Sue Hanley has already been on my Christmas card list for years because she was one of our first Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. Back when we had a focus group in 2004 when the first 20 people signed up, and oh, she runs marathons, and oh, she also coaches, and oh, she's also on our board of health, and oh, by the way, she also does like eight or nine other things I'm probably forgetting. Most important, she's also a school nurse in the middle school. I don't know how many of you, especially those of us that are not nurses, really get how hard that job is. Being a school nurse with the increasing level of physical, emotional, other difficulties, I mean, it's a really demanding job. And on top of that, she is one of the best proponents and advocates for mental illness that you will ever meet. So thank you so much for being here, Sue. And John Mandelman, we've had the honor of working with John over the past three years. He's certified in QPR, Question, Persuade, Respond, which is a way for lay people to interact with people to look for the red flags. This might be somebody who's depressed, anxious. Is this person possibly at risk of suicide? To start the conversation, to say, I'm here for you. And if you need more help than I can give, let's find that help, because people do get better and we really care about you. If there's one thing I would love to see us all come away with, for this seminar to be a catalyst of having our whole community reach out, be more compassionate, say to ourselves, for starters, 
and to our colleagues, but especially our teens. You matter. I care about you. You're important. You belong here. If you've got a problem we can't solve, let's get you the help that you need, because you are terribly important, and you're not alone. I'm going to conclude my comments right now with the end page. I won't go into a lot of detail about the thank yous, and my fingers aren't working tonight anyway. But first of all, Tracy. Where's Tracy? Raise your hands. Raise your hand. Come on. She's the gal that did such a wonderful job on her posters. Let everybody know about this. So thank you. Thank you. That was really important. Send it out liberally to everybody. And she's also an EMT taking shifts. And she's also working full time in a bariatric chamber. And she's a mom with three kids. I don't think you get more than two hours of sleep a night, right? Um, Jeff Stevens, are you in the room? He may be closing up shop, but he is our current health director and sponsor of this and also the host agent for Medical Reserve Corps. Um, I'd also like to call out Sandy Collins, who is back there helping us. I've never seen her not help with something. But uh, wave your hand, Sandy. <laughs> Because Sandy, yep. Sandy was my boss for 12 years. She was the director of the Medical Reserve Corps when it started. She was also our health director for decades. And another one of those people that, you name it, she's probably been involved in it and been a real catalyst for it. So retirement is absolutely agreeing with her. So we're glad to see her here tonight. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody else. Oh, yeah. One of our philosophies for the Medical Reserve Corps is when people give us funding, we want them to get way more than their money's worth. So these people that donated food, our grant money, typically can't be used to feed people. But we thought, well, you're coming from dinner, I mean, right from work. It'd be a nice gesture, right? So we'd like to thank Aviva Cucina again for the wonderful chips and dip. They are so nice. Um, the Rangoli Grill, we thought you might like a little Indian uh, flavor, and they were very generous with that. Yep, you're nodding your head. And oh my God, Whole Foods, those pastries, were they as deadly as they looked? Oh my God. I was afraid if I start, I wouldn't stop. I'd be knocking people over. So thank you to our vendors. Thank you to our teenagers, to Tracy, to Westford Cat, who's filming this tonight, and the Westford Public Schools who are making this available to us. So um, I know you're here to hear our speakers, and I think I'm gonna start them off early. Um, so I'd like to start off by introducing Dan Rosa. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here. Um, I have had the, the pleasure of being in the area for nearly 30 years now. And so to start, I appreciate Nancy reaching out to me. I, I do love doing these talks. And it's also a privilege for me to be speaking with John and Sue, who I've heard speak before, never been with a panel before. And my hope is that I will be a nice lead in to their conversations with you. So I was going to ask Nancy to make sure she pulls me aside. Um, we might have to shut the other mic. I did, but it's not um, to let me know, because in general, I could talk about kids and teenagers forever. Um, it's something that I've loved doing. And when, when Nancy told me it was 30 minutes, it, it got me thinking of 30. Starting my 30th year, I've been with the Chelmsford schools for 25, been in private practice down the road, closing on 28. And I started my, my life professionally in a psychiatric hospital with kids who were hospitalized. The thing that I've noticed is that you know, we, so many things change. And when I talk with kids about all the changes that have occurred over the years, they don't, they, they don't know things like even what a payphone is. And they look at us like, you know, I, I had a kid in my office, a wonderful kid, who somehow we came up about a concert I was going to, and she asked me about that box thing that records used to play on. And I said, you mean a record player? And she's like, aren't they like 100 years old? And I said, how old do you think I am? I mean, it's, and she, she's just a wonderful, wonderful kid but never had seen a, a turntable. And those type of changes have occurred. I don't, my first VCR in 1989 was my big purchase when I bought a house in Bedford. And now VCRs, you know, gone, don't exist. 
But there are other changes that we see. And we see kids growing up very fast, and yet you're going to hear, I think, in some respect, all of us talk about how as they grow up fast, they're, sometimes they're not as ready to grow up as fast as, as society is allowing them to grow up or asking them to grow up. And so then we try to delay it on the other end, and we, we say, well, they're not really grown up till they're 25. Brain doesn't fully develop then. We're finding that out. So we move some things later, but then we allow them to make decisions in Massachusetts, like at 16, they can drop out of school. Um, at 18, they can enlist. And it's, it's a very confusing time. And the thing is that the end of my presentation, I'm going to do first tonight. The kids are fantastic. They really are. They have such talent, so many gifts. Smart, I look at the math they're doing. I thought I was good in math. I don't even know what they're looking at anymore. Um, but they really have a lot of talents. Athletically, they're better than ever. If you look at scores, they keep getting better. And yet, the reason I get so passionate about coming out, and you're going to hear from Sue after me, if you, if you read the paper in the last week, I never quite know what I'm going to say. I barely bring notes anymore. But I want to be accurate with what I say. 28% rise in suicide over the last 15 years. Now, this is nationally. 44 states have had an increase. And in Massachusetts, 30% increase. Now, that's in suicide. And if we look at our teens, the numbers went up 70%. 40-year high in 2015. It's the third leading cause of death for, for teenagers. We're gonna, I'm going to look more at depression and anxiety. But those numbers, and that was, as I said, I saw it in the Globe, it was in Time, Newsweek, those are incredibly high numbers. And, and if you get to do what I do every day, you see that kids are struggling to manage the stressors that are out there. And we'll, we'll talk some about that later. So when we look at depression and anxiety amongst kids, and we wonder why have the number gone up 37% of kids coming forward and saying, I'm struggling with depression and anxiety. If we look even further, high school students in 2010, twice as likely to seek a professional as compared to the 80s. Biggest change. If, Again, in college campuses, the number of kids struggling, if you talk to anybody who's working in a college, the number of kids coming down is incredible. And so they've had to increase the numbers of, of supports that they offer. And I raise that number um, of what's happening high school, college, with, with kids like that. So I was telling um, Sue and John earlier that when I started in Chelmsford, I had started my career, as I said, in a psychiatric hospital, not as a patient. I had started it to work there. <laughs> um, and I, it was a great, great job. And I so enjoyed the opportunity to work with kids who were hurting. And I ended up leaving for two reasons. One, Chelmsford had called me about the need for more psychology in the schools. And also something called managed care had come in and had destroyed um, treatment for kids. So in 93, Chelmsford, I was hired and I worked full time in the schools as a psychologist. And my training is in clinical psychology. So I have a, my doctorate's in clinical. And a lot of schools use traditional school psychologists who are great, but Chelmsford, we, we switched to a clinical model. So I was in 93. Now we have 10 psychologists, 10 clinical psychologists in Chelmsford. Um, and we can't service the needs. Um, and I've been lucky enough to, over the years, I've done talks in Westford and Groton, and it's, it's a real pleasure and privilege for me, but the needs keep growing. Um, and if you think it's a phenomenon for the United States, one of the things I write down over, over in England, Depression rates doubled, and, and the British teenagers consider themselves the unhappiest children in the world. 
um, which is just a very sad, sad statement. So I wanted to talk for a minute about some, I think one of the biggest things that we're going to talk about tonight that I am is the internet and some of the things that I think, the many, many problems with that. But you can look on WebMD, you can look up all, everything and look at signs of depression and anxiety. And always the balance is what is normal? What is a normal teenager who's going through a tough time, growing up? It's normal for a teenager to try to pull away from their family some independence. They can be moody. Um, they can be all those things. But when it starts crossing over to things where, you know, sleep patterns change, friends change, they're, we see a lot of irritability. Those things sound normal, but as we work down the list, when the numbers go up, in terms of the number of signs and symptoms that you're seeing, it's always a, a good idea to be aware of it. But you can look up specific things like changes of friends and change in appetite and more isolation. Those things are just signs, some of it's normal and some of it is a sign that maybe they're struggling. And when you look at anxiety, we also see these huge increases and anxiety in its, of itself can be a good thing, because what's anxiety mean? Anxiety, we know that when you have some anxiety, you actually do better, you perform better. So it's okay to have anxiety. We know that that keeps you aware and it keeps you alert. But when it starts getting to a point where it interferes in your functioning, then now we have a problem. Um, and so I try to discuss with people, parents, teachers, doctors, why there's been such an increase in these numbers and why we're seeing such a, an increase in kids who are struggling, kids who are reaching out for support. And there's not a perfect answer. Um, and, and I never, never want to blame um, parents or teachers, but in many respects, We've done a lousy job. Um, and what I mean by that is one of the early talks that I used to do was on self-esteem. And we made a big mistake. We allowed people to believe that self-esteem was you could never fail, you could never better get a bad grade, you could never get cut by a sports team. Really what self-esteem is, how do you manage those things when they happen? And we don't do a great job today of allowing our kids to struggle. And the, you know, as a, I used to coach uh, Lexington High School baseball and Daniel Webster College baseball, and you can't tell a kid who's hitting 400 to make a change because they're not going to listen to you. The best teacher is failure. Um, and no one likes to fail, and it's very hard to watch your kids struggle struggle with a teacher, struggle with a boss. But it's an important thing to allow them to do. So one of the things that I've noticed is that I know that a whole host of problems are because kids struggle with self-esteem. And yet we don't, we haven't been able to do a great job of building up kids' self-esteem. And none of us are perfect at it. Um, the relationships that kids are in are so different, you know, than what we were in 30 years ago. At least that's my experience. Um, so that, that's, as the internet came into play, that became a whole nother uh, area of struggle. And for all the advantages of the internet, I believe that that's a huge factor in some of the struggles that we're seeing. But before I get to that, I wanted to talk some about some of the other things, because one of the things I push on kids all the time is physical things, getting enough sleep, eating healthy. And we just aren't, again, we're, we're just not getting enough kids to do those things. They feel so much pressure to 
um, you know, make sure they get get in every AP test or whatever, that they often are not getting enough sleep. And you can guess. I know Nancy said no questions, but how much sleep should a kid get? Do you think? You want at least eight hours, you know, for a teenager, and and you really can't catch up on it, so that when they sleep on the weekends, they're just getting their normal amounts of sleep. But, so we're not getting kids enough sleep. They're not eating as well as they could. And you know, we can go back even further when I had mentioned the self-esteem. We're also not, if we go back in school, and I'm not sure in Westford how it is, but uh, kindergarten, playtime, kindergarten's like a, an academic, uh, driven thing now, and it used to be a fun experience. It used to be something that was designed to help kids get out, get social, and now it's become a, a pressure-packed thing. I, I read about... I'll switch? Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, that's better. Um, so, that, so that kindergarten itself has become a stressful thing for kids, MCAS testing, all of that stuff. But I want to talk for a little bit about some of the, we know the pros of the internet. Um, we were talking earlier, again, all of us up front, and it, for many of us, it's, it's changed the way we've done things. So again, I, I didn't have a, I don't know when I got a cell phone. Um, the kids at the high school made fun of me for having a flip phone for a lot longer than they um, were, were deemed it cool for me to have one. but. Those changes, there are so many problems with the internet. And I, in terms of, we are living in a society of immediate, immediate, immediate gratification. And so kids are so used to it that when they're asked to slow things down somehow, they're just not used to that. And so whether it's having their phones with them all the time. I always tell people the story. When my son got a phone, um, we had a rule that you couldn't have the phone in his room. I thought it made sense. And so one day he snuck it in, and I go in, see him at night, and he's lying there sleeping with the phone on his head. And it just, and, and it made it more clear to me that this was not the way that we wanted to go. Um, so kids are on the phone till 2, 3 in the morning. They're texting. What's the average number? Anybody have a, how many text messages do you think kids share a day on the average? Average kid does 60 text messages a day. It's their number one way of communicating. It's their number one way of communicating is through text message. Well, so we know that that's true, but somehow we have, to, we have to get their phones out and get them connected again to people, to things. Everybody thinks it's, when I say it, I do too, a joke. You watch four kids walking and each of them are on the phone. They're not even talking to each other. Um, so there was a thing that many of you probably have heard. I talk, I've talked about it before, FOMO. Anyone know what FOMO stands for? Fear of missing out. And I'm probably just as guilty of it as anybody. Um, but we, we've created a generation of people, youngsters, who are fearful of missing out. So they have to have their phone with them 24-7, just in case Johnny breaks up with Sue. They need to know that at 2 in the morning. That's very, very important to them. Um, and if they don't know that till 7 in the morning, they're, they're late, and Johnny's probably already back with Sue, so everything else is gone. Um, but this fear of missing out is true for all of us. Um, I used to have a rule that I would call people back within 24 hours. So when people called my office, I would really try to call them back within 24 hours. And if I don't text a kid back within five minutes, I get 20 question marks about why. And I'm like, maybe I'm in a meeting. And they just don't understand this. They are so used to immediate, immediate, immediate gratification. One of the things that's led to and I really believe this is a big thing, is that their brains never shut off. They never shut off. They're always, they're always active, they're always going. And they never get a chance to slow down. So they're chronically, biologically, physically on edge. 
and they don't get that chance to relax and really get peace and peace of mind and relaxation. And so stress has just become a, a common, common way that they live. And that to me, that to me is a huge, huge issue. So that this fear of missing out that we all do, because we all can get immediate, 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 you know, feedback. And so it's, it's something that I think has had a huge impact on um, why we're seeing so much anxiety. Another big thing that I want to point out, I, the biggest change in my private office, so I, for 30 years, seeing just pretty much teenagers and loving that, I'm getting more and more calls from kids a little later, if they've graduated high school, maybe in college, and what they're saying to me is, this adult stuff sucks. Like, like who said this was going to be good or fun? Because we are now, in my opinion, we are now in a, in a setup, in a system, where kids believe for the first time that they will not outdo their parents. And it's having a big impact on this kind of sense of hopelessness and that there's nothing they can do. They, they can't see themselves being able to buy a house in Westford. It's so expensive. How are they going to do that? And so I've not experienced, and it's really been a change in the last seven, seven, eight years, kids feeling like there is just no way they can lead the life that they wanted to lead. And it's really had, a, had an effect on the types of decisions they make. So that has been another, another, to me, key piece in why we've seen some of this increase in depression and anxiety. I said earlier that I truly, truly, truly feel blessed and lucky to work with kids. Um, and I have for years. But we seem to have, as these depression rates have gone so sky high and the, and the anxiety rates for kids in high school and college, and, and of course, Sue you know, works here, right, in this middle school, and the number of kids struggling in a middle school and an elementary school. So in Chelmsford, again, we've now ha added a psychologist at each elementary school, and in, in addition to a school counselor at each school, and we're starting a, we're starting a therapeutic program for, for kids in elementary school who just cannot psychiatrically manage the demands of school. Um, but I raise that because as these things go up and kids are feeling that they just can't make their dreams come true, that the world's too stressful, one of the things that I really see is that we have to figure out a way to help kids learn how to be resilient and cope better. And when you can't manage your world, it's going to increase depression. It's going to increase anxiety. Because there is a lot of stress out there and there is a lot of pressure. And that being saved, whatever that might mean, because parents, in all the years I've done this, I tell kids this all the time, I've never had a parent come in who tells me that they hate their kid. Parents love their kids, and they want what's best for them. Doesn't mean we always do what's best for them, but we want what's best for them. So if, if the people in this room, from the younger side to us older people, if I got in trouble 30, 40 years ago, and I got 40 years ago at Lexington High School, there wasn't going to be much discussion. It was my fault, and I was in trouble. Today. It's very different. And we don't, you know, we're not very good in society at getting a balance. But today, when kids fail, it's usually the teacher's fault. If it's not the teacher's fault, it's undoubtedly the parent's fault. It's never the kid's fault. When they get fired, it's not their fault. It's the boss's fault. But we, we have to begin a process, I believe, of trying to have kids develop better ways to cope 
And to go back to what I said in the beginning, one of the ways you do that is by having strong self-esteem and self-esteem and strong belief in who you are and what you're doing. And one of the ways you get that is by being allowed to grow and make mistakes. And hopefully that begins to develop a process of resiliency. So we really do struggle, I think, and I think that's what I see with kids who struggle with any idea of what failure means. And yet, it is a big part of life. And so trying to help that piece happen will be very important. Another thing that I want people to know, and it's become bigger for me in the last year, and I was, again, teasing John and Sue and Nancy that as I get older, I'm more likely to get in trouble when I do these talks. So I, I will try to be good. As the political word, world has changed, we talked about changes over 30 years, and I don't mean just Trump. I don't, I don't mean that at all. You know, I don't think 30 years ago when I was a kid that we, we could have necessarily had, had Hillary Clinton be a candidate either. The world has changed, but if you look, I just read this. The number of people who trust the government has gone from in the 70 percents to like, I, I wish I could give you an exact number, but the reason I raise it, it's below 20 percent that people believe that the government is, is actively doing what's best. What, what the, the reason I bring this up is that trust has become a major issue. And to me, outside of self-esteem, trust is everything. Kids, I don't think, trust adults today. And they don't trust anymore that they're going to have a better life like we used to believe growing up. They don't trust that government officials, whether it's Trump or Clinton, or, are actively doing what's best for the country. And that was a startling stat to me. But I don't think that they trust necessarily that everyone is really working for their best interest. And I think that trust has become a huge thing. I've had that fortune, and I know I, know I got five minutes. Um, I raise that because I think probably where my biggest success has come from is that I work hard to get kids to trust me. And the, the words that, I had a kid in my office, and we were having this discussion about trust. And he's one of these great kids who, he went to a, uh, a lecture in Boston with his mother. And he's, he graduated uh, low high. And he came back and he said, Dan, trust. He said, trust is three things. Being authentic, being empathic, and being logical. And the reason I bring that up is that kids today, there's so much information out there that not only is it stressful for them, there's just too much information, but you can't really lie to kids. They know what's going on. They, they have their own ideas about it, but they know what's going on. When parents are thinking that a kid's struggling and maybe needs to go to counseling, my view is that we have to have honest discussions with kids and talk to them about it. As I said, I'm not here to criticize parents. I've had parents who their son or daughter has chosen what school they want to go to, and without telling the kid, they put a deposit down on another school um, because they think it's a better school for them. And, and I have no trouble with thinking it's a better school, but talk with your kid about it and come up with a reasonable compromise. And if we get back to what I said in the beginning, you have to begin to allow kids to make decisions and to be involved in decisions because it, it's something that's very big for their life. So I know that there's a lot, a lot of talent and a lot of great things out there for the kids, meaning that they really are a tremendous resource for us. They're our future. But when you hear numbers, those aren't made up numbers. When you hear that 44 states have reported a rise in suicide over the last 15 years, not a little rise, when you hear that kids are 
seeking out doctors twice as much as they were 30 years ago. There has to be something behind that, and there has to be something more we can do. And some of that definitely involves putting away the cell phones, more family time. We, we know studies, families that eat together do much better. Kids do much better. So here I am working three nights a week, so I'm guilty, and I understand that. Um, but you do, do the best we can to try to identify kids who are struggling and the things we can do to help them get on the right path. And part of that is listening to them, part of that is trusting them, and part of it really is understanding that with the knowledge that they have today and the, the information they can get, it's crucial that we, we involve them in the decisions. And I know that one area where I get in trouble is that I do believe kids have to make, they have to be involved in these decisions. My own son left Lexington High. I was telling John about it. He was doing some work in Lexington. He felt it was much too stressful of a town for him. And he went to Chelmsford High, and he will tell you that it saved, not necessarily his life, but it saved his academics. And um, some people said, why would you ever leave Lexington High for Chelmsford High? And I'm not, I love Chelmsford High. I've been there, like I said, just finishing my 25th year. But for him, it was the perfect place. And it was the right choice for him. So as, as we go through the night, and you'll hear Sue's story, and then, as, as I said, we'll wrap up with John. Understand that those numbers that we're seeing, they're very real, and trying to, to understand the best way to interact with kids and to get them to be their own best resource, meaning to be able to reach out for help, to have help available, um, and to listen to them is the best thing that we can start doing, I think. It sounds so simple, but to change this pattern and these growths, because as I said, the numbers, they speak for themselves. Kids are struggling. And before I end, the kids struggling, you know, we used to think of it as the kids who were struggling were, you know, not bad kids, but they were kids from troubled homes or whatever. Every year, kids struggling, they could be the best athletes, they could be in the top 10 of their class, the stress that they're feeling is so high in their desire to kind of find an answer and a way to know where their life head, is heading is so powerful that somehow we have to, I think, back that off and let them, on some level, enjoy again being able to be teenagers. So I'm going to turn it over to Sue. I appreciate everybody coming out. It's always hard to come out on a Thursday night. And I'll be, we'll be back afterwards. Our teenagers are going to be offering, if you'd like to submit some index cards with your questions, you have a 30-second stand-up and stretch break if you want. Okay? I want to say I, I totally agree with Dan. Um, and if I had my way, um, we would not have phones in the middle school for any of the middle school students. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is when, you know, as a school nurse, when parents, um, when a child doesn't feel well and they text their mother, or their father, and the mother or father comes right over and gets their child. The child has never come to see me. Um, and I think to myself, we're not building resiliency. Just like John Dan said, we're not. We're not letting kids figure out. We're saving them. We're letting the kids go to the bathroom and text mom and dad, and mom and dad come running. It's not the answer. So everyone has a story to tell. That is something a good friend of mine, a retired pediatrician, said to me a long time ago. That phrase has resonated with me, especially with regards to mental illness. Nancy introduced me, but I would like to share a little bit more about my background and why I'm standing here before all of you tonight. I grew up in a big Catholic family of seven children. When I was growing up, I knew nothing about mental illness. I studied at Boston College as a nursing student, and our psych rotation wasn't until my junior year. I remember when I was a sophomore, I was home once and saw a prescription for antidepressants for my dad. I was shocked. I remember talking to him about it and being scared and thinking, depression? My dad? Of course, my knowledge of depression was limited at that time. 
My dad, sadly, was diagnosed with leukemia when he was 53 and died at 54 when I was 26 and married with two young children. My sister, who was a year younger than me, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in her early 20s. Yet I still didn't know that much about mental illness. In fact, I was upset with my sister for several years, upset with her for doing things to my mother. It wasn't until I became a parent of a child with depression that I had a much better understanding of mental illness. My daughter, Caroline, has been my greatest teacher on this journey. C.S. Lewis once said, experience the most brutal of teachers, but you learn, my God, you learn. It is so true. Caroline will be 29 in July. She graduated from Stonehill College with a teaching degree and received her master's in special ed from Leslie College. She is a well-loved fourth grade teacher in Somerville. She's an amazing teacher. I have had the opportunity to go into her classroom, as have all of my children and my husband. Connor, who will be 22 in September and attends Northeastern University, was invited a few years back to speak to her students for college and career day. My husband, who's here tonight, is from Ireland, and he goes in every St. Patrick's Day to read to the students and to speak to the class with his Irish brogue. Ailish, who's almost 27, in her third year of med school, went into her classroom a few times when she was living in Somerville with Caroline, just because Caroline wanted her students to meet her sister. And Stephen, who's 30 and a mechanical engineer, went in recently during STEM week to talk about engineering. Caroline's students adore my grandson, who is two, and they'll be meeting my granddaughter, who is four months old, next week when they go to the aquarium. Caroline is proud of her family, and the feeling is mutual, but it certainly has not always been easy. Another phrase that is equally important, as everyone has a story to tell, is kindness matters. This is on display all over my daughter's classroom. I had no idea that Caroline was struggling with depression until her freshman year in high school. In hindsight, there were signs prior to that, but I didn't really know the signs. I'm a nurse. I have a sister with bipolar disorder, but I didn't know. When she was in fifth grade, she went through a terrible period of time with fears and in fact was in counseling briefly. She was clingy and cried with separation. She was also self-conscious and a perfectionist. I didn't know those were some of the red flags. On the outside, her middle school years were uneventful. I say on the outside because in reality, we do not know what is going on in the inside of anyone. It was her freshman year of high school when she said in a moment of anger, maybe this family would be better off without me, that I really became aware that there was more going on. I'm not gonna go through everything that happened along the way, but what I need to stress is that everyone has a story to tell. And we absolutely need to allow those stories to be heard. We have had encounters with several professionals along the way who should have known better and didn't. That's really what I want to talk about tonight. What have I learned along the way that might help others? When my daughter was in high school, she and I had a difficult relationship. She started in treatment when she was a freshman after making those comments. But at the end of freshman year, she wanted to stop counseling. I agreed. The counselor suggested meds, but Caroline seemed better, and it was summer. Sophomore year, she had her first panic attack during soccer tryouts. She was taken by ambulance for what seemed to be dehydration. It wasn't. That fall, she was put on meds by our wonderful pediatrician. I'm a firm believer that your pediatrician better be involved or really be into mental health issues. That is a huge part of everybody. And that winter, during finals, Caroline overdosed on her Lexapro. That led to a referral to a psychiatrist. During that time, I had accepted that my daughter had depression, but she did not. Caroline hated herself. That is the reality with kids with depression. They hate how they feel. They hate themselves. They hate that feeling of being out of control. I found a journal from Caroline's high school years 
when she moved out after college. I was cleaning up her bedroom and came across it. It still breaks my heart realizing how she felt. In big letters, she wrote, I hate myself, over and over. <clears throat> because they hate themselves, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when they are treated with disdain by anyone. And that includes teachers, administrators, police officers, doctors, friends, parents. Everyone has a story to tell. Are we listening? Did you know that one in five adolescents will struggle with mental health issues? I've had the opportunity to work with NAMI, which stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness, and I think there's a booth here, right? Um, where's Jenny? Oh, where's Jenny? Yeah. Yep. Back there. Thank you, Jenny. And these facts from their booklet called Parents and Teachers as Allies Recognizing Early Onset Mental Illness in Children and Adolescents. These are some of the stats. On January 3rd, 2001, the Surgeon General of the US re released a report stating that 12% of American children under the age of 18 have a diagnosable mental illness. That was 17 years ago. The numbers are real and they're increasing. 20% of youth now, ages 13 to 18, live with a mental health issue. So let's take Westford numbers. There are 2,565 students enrolled in grades 7 through 12. 20% of that number is 513. 513 of our Westford teens are struggling. A few other stats, 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by age 14, 75% by age 24. And this is a sad one. The average delay between onset of symptoms and treatment is eight to 10 years. But I think the most troubling statistic to me is that only 50% of youth with mental illness receive treatment. I said 513 in Westford are living with mental illness. So over 250? are not getting help? That is tragic. Suicide is the third leading cause of death, as, as uh, Dan said, for pe people aged 10 to 14. But I saw another statistic. It's actually the second leading cause, age 15 to 24. And 90% of those who died by suicide had an underlying mental illness. It is an epidemic, and yet education is lacking, and the stigma remains. Perception is another thing I have learned a lot about. Caroline's thoughts were often distorted. It's not that she lied about what somebody said or did, but her interpretation of it was not always accurate. She once accused me of saying she was a disappointment to me. I swear I never said that she was a disappointment to me. I may have said I was disappointed in something that she said, but it didn't matter because she heard that she was a disappointment to me. No matter how I tried to convince her, she wouldn't listen. So I finally said to her, Caroline, whatever I've done to hurt you, I am sorry. I didn't acknowledge that I said that, but I acknowledged that her ter interpretation hurt her. I also learned that you have to try your hardest to not engage them because it's what they're looking for. If you get into a fight with your child, they will not remember that they started it. All they'll remember is your response to it. All of this is good for parents to know, but what about teachers, police officers, first responders, doctors, nurses? The same is true for you as well. The only person any of us have control over is ourselves. I heard Charlie Appelstein speak a few times. I don't know if anybody ever wrote, read his book called There's No Such Thing as a Bad Kid. One of the quotes he used was, when you change the way you look at a challenging youth, the youth changes. Going into any situation, it is important to remember that and to take a deep breath and treat every, every single situation individually. Labeling is not fair. I never use the word with parents when I ask parents to share information with staff about their, their child. I ask them to share, to identify what is going on, not to label. The summer before Caroline's senior year of high school was very challenging. She went off her meds and didn't believe she had any problems. I remember once her screaming at me, I am happy. I'm just not happy with you. 
College visits in the fall were heartbreaking because she didn't say a word to me in the car. She refused counseling and meds, and I knew that it would take her hitting rock bottom to change anything. <clears throat> rock bottom came just after Christmas. She found out she had gotten into Stonehill before Christmas, and that was her number one choice. Her reaction was much lower key than I would have anticipated, and we had a horrible Christmas that year. I was scared to death. Mental illness affects the entire family. That was a very difficult time for Caroline's 10-year-old brother, 15-year-old sister, 19-year-old brother, and of course my husband and I. I had done some research and found out about a homeopathic remedy for depression, a combination of 5-HTP and vitamin B12. A few days after Christmas, I asked her if she would please try this for one month. She agreed. Unfortunately, on December 30th, after an argu argument with me, she took the whole bottle and then went to a basketball game in Tingsboro with friends. A call came in soon after that that something was wrong with Caroline. One of her friends said she was throwing up and they found the empty bottle. An ambulance was called and we asked that she be taken to Emerson where she had been treated before. They took her to Lowell General because of the seriousness of what happened. It was the closest hospital. We had a horrendous experience in that ER. Again, people who should have known better, doctors and, doctors and nurses, did not seem equipped to handle the situation. They treated my daughter as an overdose instead of a young lady suffering from depression, who in a desperate moment made a desperate decision. And I was treated as a difficult mother instead of as a mom who often felt so helpless and alone. Everyone has a story to tell. Not once did any of the nurses or doctors ask me how I was or tell me how sorry they were for what we were going through or even to ask me any questions. It's too long a story to share, but I, what I can tell you is that the doctor with the charge nurse standing next to him had me escorted out of the ER by a security guard. They had filed a Section 12. A lot of you probably don't know what that is. But basically, they had taken all decision-making away from my husband and I and given it to the hospital. They made a decision to admit her to an inpatient program. My daughter was crying as they led me away. I will never forget that night as long as I live. Fortunately, there were some kind staff members there, a clinical nurse leader and a different security guard. I was allowed back to be in with my daughter. I was not against hospitalization. It was the way it was handled. We were not part of a team making the best plan going forward. How is that possible? <laughs> She's our daughter. We had known her for 17 years. She had a psychiatrist and a therapist. We were doing everything we could. These people had met her for a few hours, and they made a decision. And the bed they found for her was at Bornwood in Jamaica Plain. They filed the Section 12, made a determination that she was to be hospitalized, and that was the end of their care. It was, and Bornwood, God forgive me, it was like a juvenile detention center. That placement did more harm than good because her idea of hospitalization was not a good one. Do you know that for the rest of that night, while we waited to find out where my daughter would go, no one ever came back to check in on her or me. My husband had been there that night, too. He had gone home to be with our other children. That night was a turning point for Caroline in her acceptance of her illness, and it was a turning point for me as well. My own people. <laughs> Doctors and nurses had really let me down. How is it possible with a high incidence of mental health issues that hospital ER staff are not properly trained? Kindness matters. A little kindness would have made a world of difference that night. Caroline had another experience in an ER in Connecticut when she was in college. She had been visiting a friend at Trinity and had too much to drink. She was missing for a while and was taken by ambulance to an ER there. We got the phone call. She had been found and was in the ER. I have a lot of family in Connecticut, so one of my sisters picked Caroline up. And when Caroline got home, she sunk in even further into a depression. She said the staff were mean to her. 
Now, I'm not an ER nurse. I'm sure there are many college students who end up in ERs for drinking. Are they all treated as another stupid college student? Everyone has a story to tell. Individual biases have to be put aside. I told you earlier that kids who suffer from depression often hate themselves. Imagine how they feel as part of a family, the one who's always making the mistake. Maybe the family would really be better off without me. How can they not think that when people who should know better often make it worse? Caroline overdosed for a third time after she graduated from college. Transitions are so difficult for individuals with depression. That time, the nursing medical staff were very kind. One ICU, ICU nurse. I'm sorry, all these years later, it's still. She took the time to really talk to me and shared with me a personal story. For, she reassured me that Caroline was going to be OK. She had a son who had also attempted suicide when he was younger and was now married with a family. <clears throat> I never forgot that either. Education is paramount. And I'm not talking about attending a seminar, a day-long seminar. I'm talking about lifelong learning. 911 has been called several times for my daughter, by me and by others. The first responder for 911 is the police officer. What kind of training has been done for police officers in dealing with mental health? And again, I'm not talking about a class day. I have spent the last 14 years of my life learning as much as I can to help my daughter and to help the students and families I work with at Stony Brook. I still have more to learn. No one should ever assume they have had enough training. I love the show Criminal Minds. Have any of you seen it? Um, it's about serial killers. I'm digressing a little bit. My husband doesn't like it. I think the, in, the reason I really enjoy it is besides the way that they solve the mysteries is the way they validate for the perpetrator why they are acting the way they are. They show the skill behind de-escalating de a volatile situation by getting to know the individual. So validation, probably the most important gift we can give to anyone, especially those struggling. I am so sorry for all you're going through. I can't imagine how difficult this must be. I cannot begin to imagine the pain you are feeling. A few examples of something you can say that can de-escalate a situation. I told you I'm constantly learning. John Madelman here, who's going to speak next, I went to a training he did. I think I went to a few. But one was for all the nurses in Westford. Sandy Collins had gotten a grant, I think. And, but one thing he said that has stayed with me, he said to use three little words. Tell me more. Gentle words to encourage an individual to share their story. Caroline has been my greatest teacher. When she was 19, and I was and am on meds for depression, I take my Celexa every day, I'm not ashamed, I said to her, I know what you're going through. I was trying to relate to her and, and to say I could empathize with her. She put me in my place, rightly so, and said, you have no idea what I'm going through. You're not 19 years of age. I learned to never say to anyone, I know what you're going through. None of us know exactly what someone else is going through. We can say, I've been under treatment for depression, it stinks, or I'm really sorry for all you're going through, but we're all different people with different experiences. People who should have known better and didn't. Freshman year of college at Stonehill. I told you Caroline finally accepted her diagnosis of depression, and the second half of her senior year was so much better, than, better between her and I. and in general at home. She was under psychiatric and therapeutic care. She took her meds faithfully, met regularly with her outside counselor as well as her guidance counselor at school. There were still ups and downs, but acceptance made the journey a little more tolerable. Plans were made for the future. In March, we went up to Stonehill before the final decision was made to enroll her there in the fall. We met with the head of counseling at Stonehill and shared Caroline's story. There is no shame. I would hope that parents of children with diabetes or any other chronic illness would do the same when a child is going to college and still need of assistance with their help, their health. Dr. Price was wonderful. 
I think Caroline and I came away feeling good about where she'd be going in the fall. And it was a relief that she was only going to be an hour up the road. As I said earlier, transitions are very difficult for anyone with a mental health issue. Caroline went through some struggles at the end of her first semester of her freshman year and ended up coming home for three weeks in November and doing an outpatient program nearby because of continual difficulties with self-injury and suicidality. God bless her. She finished that first semester with all of her classmates. Unfortunately, that March, Caroline made a very poor teenage decision. She was caught smoking pot in her dorm room. But it was the fallout from that which led me once again to feel protective of my daughter and how prevalent the stigma is. She, of course, spiraled down once again. This idea of it's always me messing up and maybe this family would be better off without me. My husband and I went up to meet with the dean who had already had conversations with in the fall when Caroline was in the outpatient program. The head of counseling and a few other individuals were also present to discuss the sanctions, 16 weeks out of on-campus housing and the impact this would have on Caroline, including housing in the fall as well, because this happened in March. We talked about Caroline's struggles, and we shared everything about what had transpired over the past several years, and asked if they would consider saving a place in a dorm suite with friends that we would pay for, so that accommodations were made, so that she would know at least where she was living in the fall. No accommodations were made. That wasn't the worst part. The worst part was when the dean, who was a priest, because Stonehill's a Catholic college, said to us, maybe Stonehill's not the right place for your daughter. Shouldn't he know a little bit about mental illness, being a dean at a college? I asked him if he would ever say that to a parent of a child with diabetes, cancer, or life-threatening allergies. Kindness matters. Last spring, I received an award for work with mental health and decided it was time to educate the president of Stonehill College. Yep, he's now the president. I sent him an entire package with a cover letter and an old email from Caroline's college days reminding him of who I was. I shared resources and articles about the prevalence of mental illness on college campuses. I told him how well Caroline was doing, but asked him to never say to another parent what he had said to us. I never heard back, but I finally had closure. Maybe some other family was spared. I have spent the last 14 years not only learning as much as I can, but also supporting my beautiful daughter and trying hard to help her navigate in a very stigmatized society. She is the brave one in all of this. She has allowed her very personal story to be shared, first in a documentary out of Children's Hospital that is shown in countless high schools. Westford Academy has it for ninth graders. She's also allowed me to speak, and she's, she's come with me to do a few, a few of the presentations. If we don't put a face to it, nothing will ever change. Caroline has been my greatest teacher. I am exceedingly proud of her. She works hard every day to be healthy. She's still on meds, still goes to counseling, but now is positively influencing young children in Somerville. She knows the signs and symptoms of depression. She has her eyes wide open and does so much in her classroom to make kids feel good about themselves because she knows all too well how painful it is to hate yourself. Kindness really does matter. We all have an opportunity every single day to make a difference in another's life just by being kind. Everyone has a story to tell. Thanks so much for listening. Wow. <laughs> My good heavens, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And you find it puts a face to it when there's a person talking about it in their life. And I bet a lot of other people just keep it to themselves and don't share for privacy or whatever. But one of the things that makes me scratch my head about the timing of the seminar, the minute, I don't know if Michael Goldsberry is here, but the minute we found out that we got the grant, we started setting up the seminar. But what happened in the last week and a half? Who did we lose on June 5th? You're right, you know. Kate Spade, Kate Spade, okay. And on Friday, Anthony Bourdain, yeah. And it sort of like casts a bigger shadow when it's a celebrity. These, 
So when Sue was saying that people don't even understand, they don't know what it is, you compare your insides to somebody else's outsides, and I'm sure kids are a lot more susceptible to that. So when we were first talking about having Sue speak, she sent me some literature, including um, one about, I have mental illness, and this is what it's like, and I had no clue. So she put a table full of literature there. I highly recommend that you pick some of it up. I don't know if I called out Pamela Teshi also, um, but she's working in a program with Jim Antonelli, the principal of um, Westford Academy, about challenge success to help us be more empathetic with our kids and the pressures that they're under. So um, our teenagers are out there in case any of you have any more questions on your index cards. And I'm going to turn it over to John Mandelman. Great. I'm really happy to be here. Tonight I'm going to be talking about the secret life of teens. I'm going to be looking at my watch constantly because I'm telling you, if you go over, they just cart you out of here. So I also want to thank Sandy Collins. I would never have gotten to Westford without uh, Sandy. And also, you do not say no to Nancy Burns. You just, you just say yes right away. I learned that. So I'm going to be talking about some of the mental health challenges that young people face. I'm going to be talking about um, social media too, um, the adolescent brain, and some of the secrets that young people have. Usually when I give this talk, it's for 95 minutes. I'm going to condense it into 30. It will not work. You're going to feel really frustrated. But I'll be hanging out afterward if you want to talk to me, for sure. Um, and I want to tell you, I do have one brag when I speak. Um, when my kids were in middle school and high school, uh, my son and daughter, um, I only had one fight with them. And this is really true, and this is why I'm an expert, only one fight. That was from September of 2002 to June of 2010. It was one eight-year battle, which I lost many of them. I remember I came home one time um, when my son was in high school, and he looked up at me and he said, Dad, what were you doing tonight? I said, this is incredible. He's actually interested in something other than himself. I said, well, Jake, I was working. He said, but what were you doing? I said, I was at work. He said, but what were you doing at work? I knew I was in trouble here. I said, I was actually talking to parents about parenting. And he said, well, based on your parenting of me, what makes you think you can help any other parent? So I'll let you guys decide uh, in the next uh, 29 minutes or so. So kids have secrets from us for really good reasons. They don't like to share things. They think they're strange and crazy for feeling that way. But primarily, they have secrets from us because they don't like to disappoint us. Now, I know a lot of you guys are sitting there thinking, are you kidding? They don't like to disappoint us. They disappoint us all the time. They do. But when they disappoint us, that's a very heavy burden. My mom is 88. My dad is 92. I still don't like to disappoint my parents. And when kids disappoint us, I'm going to generalize here. Boys feel a measure of shame. Girls feel a little bit more guilt. That's what's going on inside. Externally, you know, they have a lot of anger about that. So when your kids are angry at you, you just might want to think to yourself, better that they're angry at me because now I know what it's all about. Um, I want to jump into some of the secrets that they have. And the first secret I want to talk about is that teens want parents to listen. Now, they've gone a long way to tell us to butt out of their lives and they know what they're doing. But deep down, they want to share their fears, their joys, and more. And the reason they don't, and I'm pointing to myself, is because of us. Good example, my daughter Jessie was a crappy math student. She got a crappy grade, as always. What do I say? Did you understand the material? Did you study hard enough? Did you talk to the teacher? Can you take a makeup test? Do you need a tutor? On and on and on with analysis, judgment, and feedback. Who the heck would tell us anything when we're always doing that? And when we're not doing that, we're doing this. I remember talking to my son Jake, also a bad math student. Guess what? So was I. It's all my fault. It really is. And um, he is kind of looking at me with a grin. And I said, Jake, what are you thinking about? He says, mm mm, cannot tell you, Dad. I said, why not? He says, I will get in trouble if I tell you. I said, you will not get in trouble. I said, I'm thinking I should build a podium because all you do is lecture me. And you know what? He was right. And when I wasn't doing that, I was fixing things. Raise your hand if you're a fixer parent. I'll tell you why we fix, because we know what to do. Of course we do. We've done it 50, 100, 500 times. I remember talking to my daughter one time. She and I were the main combatants when she was growing up. She just turned 30. We, 30. We're still the main combatants, uh, but a little bit fairer now. And I remember having a conversation with her, and we were going up what I call the anger escalator. We had done this 
hundreds of times. We get angry at each other. My wife would be so pissed at me, she wouldn't talk to me for two days. My son, he hated conflict. He would go to his room. And I just replicated this all the time. And finally, I said to her in desperation, Jesse, do you want me to talk or just listen? And I'll never, ever forget what she said to me. I'm going to quote her verbatim, even though it was 15 years ago. She looked at me and she said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I said, what? She says, are you capable of listening? And the reality was, when I was talking to her, I wasn't so capable. I wasn't listening. I was thinking about what I was going to say. I was teaching her things. And the best way to listen is just to stop talking. And something miraculous happened that time. She talked for 15 minutes without fear of analysis, judgment, and feedback. And at the very end, she said, so, Dad, what do you have to say? I knew this was coming. I know this hook. Here's what I said. It was one of my best parenting moments. I said, thank you. Because I realized then it's more important what they say than what we say. How could that be? If a teen has grown up in your home, they've been in your home for 5,000 days. And I say this lovingly because I adore teens. Even the dumbest teen knows the family rules, the family expectations. They know when they've screwed up. They can't always do the right thing, but they know when they've done it. And we have to really remember that. Um, so let's talk about this. Um, how many of you have noticed that you have better conversations with your kids in a car? Yeah, why is that? Yeah, they don't like Because here's what happens. We're talking to our kids, and our face is scrunching up and communicating this, like, are you insane? Like, that can't be true. Why are you doing that crazy stuff? So we have better conversations in the car. It's really not environmentally sound to be driving around forever. And I remember talking to my daughter one time, and she was rolling her eyes. And I said, Jesse, stop rolling your eyes. And she said, but you're rolling your eyes. And now we are fighting about the rolling of the eyes. <laughs> Back and forth. And again, in desperation... I flicked off the lights where we didn't have to look at each other. She didn't have to see my anger, frustration, puzzlement, disappointment, rolling of the eyes. And that started dozens and dozens of conversations with both of my kids in the dark. You're so screwed. When your dad's a therapist, I feel so bad for my kids. Everything gets tried out on them. But I'll tell you, that first conversation was great because it started out like this. She laughed. Lovely way to start a conversation. I know she was rolling her eyes in the dark. I was rolling mine. She was probably sticking out one of these digits. That's okay. But we had dozens and dozens of conversations in the dark. When my son was a freshman at Clark University, he got in a little bit of trouble. Actually, it was in a lot of trouble. He borrowed a friend's car, came home to see us. My wife's so smart. She said, I'm going to bed. You handle this. The house is completely dark. He walks in, takes a left, goes in the living room and says, Dad, I know you're in here somewhere. So the next thing I want to talk about is that everything your kids do, they do for a reason and a good reason. Drinking, drugging, thoughts of self-harm, suicide. It makes sense to them. When my son Jake came home drunk, I said to him, Jake, I know you got drunk for a good reason. By the way, my wife said to me, what are you, an idiot? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. He did. He got drunk for a good reason. Always interested in alcohol. Always interested in being drunk. Really interested in being very drunk. Hanging out with older kids and feeling the peer pressure. Hanging out with older athletes he wanted to impress. Everything kids do, they do for a good reason. So when your child does something that maybe is illegal, is dangerous, whatever, we have to say to that child, instead of saying, like, what are you, like, crazy? What are you, stupid? You didn't think? Try to reframe and say, I know you did it for a good reason. Because our job as parents is to have our kids be thoughtful. Now, there's plenty of time to tie in other rationalities of health and safety and welfare and that sort of thing. But when I asked my son, Jake, tell me your reasons for getting drunk. First of all, he wasn't happy about it. He just said, punish me like every other parent. We talked about it. It helped him grow to understand it. And I had plenty of time to talk about how he could make a better decision. And it's a 20-minute story I tell, but we ended up in an AA meeting. Um, so it was a really interesting uh, time we had. The next thing I want to talk about is really interesting and important. When your kids are not achieving in any realm, socially, academically, even athletically, you must ask yourself this question. Is it they can't? or they won't 
Here's what I mean by that. Say I've forgotten my notes in my car, and I ask someone to go out, could you please get my notes? And I see someone who has a broken leg over there. This is perfect. And I said, could you please go out and get my notes? And they say, well, I can't. I have a broken leg. They don't have the capacity, as opposed to they won't. If I had set my son, when he was a baseball player in high school, to the Red Sox, and he had struck out 10 times in a row, would I be angry at him? Of course not. He didn't have that capacity. It's not that he wouldn't play better for the Red Sox. He couldn't. Didn't have the capacity. Well, I have to tell you, when my son was in high school, he was a disorganized boy. Raise your hand if you have a disorganized boy at home. Is that redundant? Is that the same word, disorganized and boy? I'm one of those, by the way, so I, I live it. And I was so angry at Jake. I was so angry, he was so disorganized. I got him a tape recorder, it cost me like 50 bucks. So disorganized, so angry at him. He'd forget his baseball glove at the field every day. He'd forget his homework and forget to look online for the homework. But I kept saying to myself, it's going to get better. Seventh grade was bad. Eighth grade was worse. Ninth grade was the worst. Oh, my goodness. He was in high school. It was just terrible. I kept saying to myself, junior year, it gets it together. Junior year, I'll be OK. Junior year. And my wife kept saying, is this based on clinical research or is this prayer? I said, this is prayer. <laughs> junior year, junior year. Ninth grade was terrible, as I said. Tenth grade, I saw no evidence of growth whatsoever. None. None. Junior year, junior year, junior year. And I'm going to pat myself on the back, because this is true. He did get it together junior year of college. And I wish I were making a joke. <laughs> I am not. Because junior year of college at Clark University, he called us up and said, you know what? I've been screwing around for a long time. I'm not invested in my community. I'm drinking too much. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm ready to change. I would have loved to have, him have changed when he was a junior in high school. But you know what? It's not that he wouldn't. He couldn't. He didn't have the maturity. He didn't have the brain development to change. Now, we used to call kids like Jake late bloomers. He was not a late bloomer at all. He was on his own time frame. It would have been nice had he been on mine, but he was on his own, and that is OK. And I always say to parents, never ever change your expectations, but you might have to change your timeline. If Jake walked in here now, and I told you a couple more crazy stories about him in high school, you wouldn't believe that's the kid I'm talking about. He looks different. As we said, as you know, Dan said earlier, the brain develops to at least 25. Now that Jake is 26, I say 26. If you hear me speak next year, it'll be 27. I'm going to have to stop at 30, but the point is it's just uh, growing and changing. So let's talk about the adolescent brain a little bit. So the adolescent brain is really, you know, these are new experiences. They're going to make mistakes. They're passively choosing. Instant gratification is high on the list. And we used to think that kids don't understand risk. Actually, the adolescent brain is really smart. They understand risk very, very well. But they're more drawn to the social reward. Their friends saying that's cool. And they don't have what most adults have, and that's a breaking system. The thing in our brain which says to us, mm -mm, I could get arrested. That's morally wrong. This could hurt me. That sort of thing. So that's the difference. If we have the braking system, that would be great. But they don't have it. They are going to make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they feel really bad about it. And when that anger is outward at us, we should say, thank goodness. Because when it's inward, that's depression. And you're talking a little bit about self-esteem and that sort of thing. I, I don't talk about that. I talk about this generosity. So you know about generosity during the holidays, where you might donate your time or money to some cause, a food bank, a soup kitchen, that sort of thing. I'm talking about self-generosity. And it looks like this for my son, Jake. I used to be a starter on the Belmont High School basketball team. Now I'm on the bench. Now I barely play. That's OK. My daughter, Jesse, I just want to do well in one math test. Studied really hard. All she got was a C. That's OK. Now, some of you are out there thinking, wait a second, John. We're letting our kids off the hook. 
Let me tell you about my son. He tortured himself. After practice, he stayed for a full hour. Every basketball practice, he was desperate to get on that court. But people who are self-generous don't torture themselves. And they're ready for the next challenge that's coming down the line. I'm not very good at it. I've worked on myself. We all need to work on ourselves and say to our kids, that's OK. Because again, people who are tough on themselves are thinking in the past and not ready for the thing coming down the line. OK, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, let's talk about this. So how many, raise your hand if you've ever had this experience with your kid. And you've seen their behavior at home, you say, based on what I'm seeing at home, they'll never get a job, they'll never have a relationship, they'll never, 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 like we drive ourselves crazy. Here's what I say to you. Your kids are at their worst at home, but guess what? So are you. For those of you who are working in an office, if you said, in your office setting, what you say at home, you would have been fired five times over. We're all at our worst at home, and that's okay. And maybe you've had this experience, you know, you're just thinking, oh my goodness, this kid's just never going to amount to anything, they'll never this. And then your child goes out to eat at someone's house, and that parent calls you up and says, Jake was over, and you say, oh boy, this is going to be bad. He was a lovely kid. He actually helped serve. He cleared the dishes. He's washing the dishes. He's painting the baby's room, and he's helping us with our summer plans. He's like, who is this? Like, we don't know. So we really have to understand that it's coming a lot from other people. Can we put the slide up? I just want to show, I want to show one quick slide. So these are the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, this is a typical high school. Um, these are the statistics um, about the number of people who are dealing with some mental health issues. That's okay, you can just leave it like that, that's fine. So let's look at this. Now, of course they vary, but let's look at this, wow. So if we had a typical middle school of 600 kids, um, it's factored out. And you can see 81 students have seriously thought about suicide. 21 middle school students, typical high school, have actually attempted. We spend a lot of time in high school, for example, about driver's ed. For good reason. Accidents are the number one cause of death in that age group. We don't spend nearly enough time on mental health challenges, if you think about it. And let's look at the high school numbers. You can see the discrepancy between male and female. Um, some of the reasons, there are a couple reasons for that, but primarily I think the females are just being a little bit more forthright and being honest. But let's look at the number of, of students in a typical high school of uh, 1,200 kids um, who have seriously considered suicide, 157. If I told you that 157 kids at Westford Academy had diarrhea, yes, I did say diarrhea in case you were napping, <laughs> right? What would the health department do? They closed down the damn building. Can you see, you'd be retired in Florida in like 30 years. They say, you meet someone, you're from Westford. Oh, is that the diarrhea place? Like everyone would remember that. Well, diarrhea is not a lot of fun, but it's not gonna end your life, at least in this country. That will. And look at the number of students who have a plan and have attempted. These statistics, by the way, are from Wilmington High School when I did my full 95 minutes of the secret life of teens. Wow. We've been really lucky in Massachusetts because uh, when I say that, that we haven't had more completed suicides. And of course, we want to use the correct terms. You don't want to use the term successful suicide. And we all need to do a better job. Now I'm going to check how much time do I have left? 45 minutes. That's great. All right. All right, raise your hand if you've been to Fenway Park. They're going to break our hearts. You know they will, but it's fun for now. Okay, imagine you're in Fenway Park, and imagine looking to your left and looking to your right and looking in the dugout and looking at every kid or adult in the stands. That's the number of people that die by suicide every year in this country. About 44,000 people. Wow. This is a crisis, and don't let anyone tell you differently. In the last reporting year, the statistics just came out for Massachusetts. We have, first of all, we have about 650 completed suicides in Massachusetts. That's about three times the number when we look at homicides. If, raise your hand, and we'll have some fun with this. If you're in the age group between 45 and 54, that's the most number of completed suicides in Massachusetts. So why are we talking about young people? I'll tell you why. Because between the age of 10 and 24, it is the second leading cause of death. I've worked with so many families 
that have lost a young person to suicide. I've known middle school children who have taken their lives by suicide. And we all need to do a better job. I want to tell a quick story about a guy by the name of Kevin Hines. Kevin was a guy who decided that nobody cares. Life will be better without me. He was making a good decision in his mind. Obviously, it wasn't good for his health and safety and welfare. He thought the world would be a better place. He felt shameful. And we, can, we always need to say to our young people, whatever you do, it's OK. Shameful for what he hadn't done in life. And Kevin was going to the one singular place where the most number of suicide attempts have happened, and that's the Golden Gate Bridge, built in 1937. And he's on a public bus crying, and he's saying to himself over and over, if one person will ask me, are you OK? Can I help you? He won't do it. But nobody said a word. And as it turns out, he had to transfer and get on another bus, sobbing openly. Nobody says a word. And finally, he notices the bus has come to a halt. Thank God, somebody's going to save me. It's the bus driver. And he looks up. And the bus driver says, it's the end of the line. you got to get off. It's the gate, base of the Golden Gate Bridge. He gets off. He starts walking up the bridge. Nobody notices. Nobody cares. One of the mantras about suicide is it's not that people want to die. It's that they can't figure out a way to go on living. And that's Kevin's was in his mind. Nobody cares. And he takes himself and he throws himself over the bridge. Four seconds by the time you go off that bridge till you hit the water. One, two, three, four. He goes down 80 feet. I don't know about you, but when I'm in a pool five feet under, I'm freaking out. Goes down 80 feet. All the way down, he's thinking, I wish I hadn't done it. His first thought is, am I alive? His second thought is, thank God I'm alive. And somehow he claws his way to the surface, even though he had literally 100 broken bones. His eardrums are burst. And he's exuberant. How could this be? Someone who wanted to end his life. But now he's got a problem. <laughs> he's in the middle of the bay. Did anyone see him jump? How's he going to live? And he can't swim. He can barely survive. And he's in the water for just a minute. And he feels this. And then again. And again. And now he realizes what this is. This is a shark who is going to eat him. How crazy is this? He has survived jumping off the bridge. Thousands have jumped off that bridge. Only about 25 or 30 has survived. And he is going to get eaten by a shark. So come on. We're in the summer. You guys have seen Shark Week. What do you do if a shark attacks you? Punch him in the nose, right? I spoke in Sandwich two months ago. 170 parents. Not one parent knew that. I said, come on. This is a safety thing. You're on the Cape, for goodness sake. He's flailing at this animal, flailing, flailing, keeping himself alive. And again, and again, and again, desperate to be alive. Someone who's going to take his life moments ago. And a boat comes out, and that boat typically comes out, and they're picking up bodies. They have body bags. Very, very, very rarely is someone alive. And they're pretty excited, too. And they pull him up, and they say, do you know what happened? But he can't hear. His eardrums are burst, and they start screaming, do you know what happened? He says, yes, I jumped off the bridge. No, no, no. Do you know what happened? Yes, I jumped off the bridge. No, do you know what happened in the water? He says, yes, that shark was going to eat me. They said, that was no shark. We could see the whole thing when we were coming out. This is what it was. You were sinking below the surface. You couldn't keep yourself afloat. And we could see that was a sea lion that was pushing you in the back and keeping you afloat and keeping you alive. We all need to do a better job around keeping all of us, not just young people, safe and alive. If someone walks in this building and they have a broken leg, we're opening up all the doors. We're helping them. But it takes a lot of courage. If you have anxiety to come into this building or to go into the cafeteria, it takes a lot of courage if you have depression and you've been hospitalized to go back to your school. I want to tell you, the most courageous people I know are people who say they have a problem. We don't do that very well in, in our culture. And when I've experienced that as a therapist, and I've experienced this with my own son, I can tell you what I said to my son, Jake, and <laughs> I know why it's emotional for you. It gets very real. I just said, thank you. Thank you for taking the risk.
People don't always know how to ask for help. I remember chasing a client out of my office. I told him we had to hospitalize him. He was suicidal. And I finally caught up with him. It was miraculous. This kid was a 10th grader in great shape. I'm kind of an old guy, and I'm a good athlete, but I'm slow. I caught up with him. And when I was talking to my friend Nancy about it afterward, she started to laugh. And I said, what's so funny? She says, you could never have caught him. He wanted to get caught. People don't always know how to ask for help. We have to have eyes on them constantly, and we have to say to them, are you okay? Or you seem unhappy? Or how can I help you? And you know what? It is okay. Think about this, and I'm going to conclude. I know I'm over. How, what? I have five minutes. It's great. Okay. So um, think about this. Someone who needs help, mental health help, it's very hard to find a, a therapist. It's really hard to find a good therapist. It takes a long, long time. Anyone who's had a child having to do with mental, having mental health challenges will tell you it's really hard to ask for help. And we also know a very significant percentage of people with mental health issues don't get help for a good reason to them. It's not going to make any difference. It's hard to find someone. It costs money in my insurance. It makes sense to them. But I have to tell you something. Think about it this way. If you broke your leg, you wouldn't try to fix it yourself, would you? If you broke your leg, you wouldn't be waiting six months, a year, or eight years for treatment. No. If you have a young person in your life who won't get treatment, do whatever you have to do to bargain with that child to get them into treatment and find a good therapist. Because I'll tell you, it can change a life. Okay, so I only got about two minutes left. Most of the stuff I wanted to talk about I didn't get to, but that, that happens. Um, I guess I just want to say um, two quick things. Um, one is that when my son was in high school, and he was involved in all sorts of risky behaviors. It freaked me out. I wasn't a therapist. I was just a dad who didn't know what the hell he was doing. But I knew this. I said, Jake, I'm going to contact all of your friends' parents, and we are going to meet. He was pretty pissed off about it, i got to tell you. He said, why are you doing that, Dad? Why do you have to be a therapist all the time? I said, because you know what? I adore you. And my job as a parent, and your job is to keep your child safe. And I had, my wife and I had these parents in two or three times a year. Get on the same page about technology. If you're going to the Cape, to your Cape house, I'd like to get an email so I know what's going on. We decided we were not going to have any sleepovers after eighth grade because not a lot of good stuff happened. And this was one of the most protective things we did for my son. At the end of every meeting, my son said, do you have to do this a couple times a year? You're ruining my life. And I said, well, I know it feels that way. He certainly entitled that. But I want to tell you, I want to make sure you're here, Jake. And I want to make sure you're safe. And I believe it's one of the most important parenting things I did to call on the power of other parents. Because if Jake walked into their house and was drinking, I want to know. If Jake walked into that house and was depressed, didn't seem like himself, I want to know. And we've all had this experience. You're going to pick up your kid. It's freezing out. You look like crap. You're in your sweatpants. You, say, you call your kid on the phone. Come outside. I'm here. You got to get your tuchus out of that car. You got to meet that parent. And you have to establish some sort of relationship because you need all the parents that you can get to keep your own kids safe. All right. So I didn't talk about... Um, I didn't talk about technology, but I'm going to give you an assignment. Go home tonight or tomorrow. Go on YouTube and type in Amanda Todd, T-O-D-D. Um, it's 8 minutes and 55 seconds. It's in black and white. And this is about a young person who did what every young person should do, make a mistake. But when you make a mistake online, something called object permanence, if you remember that, it stays forever. Um, the last thing I will say is around technology, I love technology. But I can tell you this, it's not very good in terms of everyone's mental health. But I'll tell you a story. My wife, my, when my son turned 25, my wife put a picture of Jake up at 25 and a picture of Jake up at 1. Uh, and she put it on her Facebook. We're in bed talking and for about half an hour. And she says to me, I need to check my Facebook. I said, why? She says, I have to see how many likes I have. I said, you're 58 years old. Come on, get over it, you know? <laughs> 
Everyone presents an edited version of life on social media. Raise your hand if you know someone on Facebook or Instagram who projects very well, but they're not as happy as they look. Anybody have that? Yeah. But for young people, they're living their life unedited, and that discrepancy is really tough. So I'm going to stop here to just try to get onto the limit. Uh, thank you guys for having me here tonight. Thank you so much, each of you. You know, I really don't crack the whip like that, you know, and I'm better here than I am at home probably, huh? So could we gather whatever index cards we've gotten so far and then one last round in case you have any others to submit. We'll start going with questions that way. If time permits, we'll open it up for discussion. Just want to make sure we had time. Did we collect any cards so far? Did we get any cards? And you have 30 seconds to stand and stretch before you sit down again, if that helps. OK. Especially those of us that got up early or worked a whole long day or got in our exercise, it's a long time. And while we're here, help me re uh, remind everybody, make sure that you signed, everybody signed the general sign-in sheet, which you just initial if you were pre-registered, filled in your name if you didn't. The EMTs, you know to fill out the OMS roster. The nurses knew to sign on the signing roster for just nurses. We want everybody's evaluation form on their way out. Uh, Sandy and I asked two people to help, and Gail, our uh, two nurses are going to be collecting the nursing evaluations only. For, we hold them hostage for your certificates, okay? All right. And please do fill out your evaluations. There's two sides of it. We really want to hear from you, okay? How are we doing? Did we have any that have somebody's name in the top? Any others? Thank you for contributing your questions. You're wearing glasses. Maybe I should have you start. OK. All right. Sue, you want to go with the first one? Oh, OK. Um, the question, how can local nurses get more involved in the mental health world? Uh, and how did living with your sister with bipolar help prepare you to raise your daughter? Um, well, obviously, for all the school nurses, I think everybody knows how I feel, but I guess all the local nurses, how to get more involved in the mental health. Um, I wish, one thing I forgot to mention is we have a service called the Interface Referral Service in Westford. They have it in Chelmsford as well. Um, it is a way to get help. So sometimes if you're trying to find a counselor and that's very hard to do, this is a help helpline that anybody in Westford um, has access to. And I don't think everybody knows about it. <laughs> so I think that I would love to see nurses help get information out about it. Um, and you know, I, I think there just needs to be more educational opportunities. So if there's any nurses out there that want to get involved we're always looking for opportunities to do some type of parent programs. Um, through the health department, Jeff Stevens has been excellent about mental health. Sandy Collins always was. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I, it, it does take a community to raise a child, you know. Um, in terms of how did living with my sister with bipolar help prepare me? Um, interestingly, as my sister wasn't diagnosed until she was in her 20s, there were signs, I suppose, beforehand um, that I didn't know about either. Um, she was a little reckless in college, and and you know, again, in hindsight, there was some crazy stuff that went on. But as I said, I think the problem was I didn't handle it well. Um, I felt like she was, like I said, doing things to my mom. So. I don't think living with my sister with bipolar helped me prepare how to raise my daughter. I think raising my daughter has helped prepare me to be a better sister. Um, my sister has her master's degree from Harvard, and she's a teacher. So she's doing awesome. Again, our mental illness does not define us. It doesn't. Can I just, just add um, one of the questions, why don't we have classes in schools about anxiety, depression, mindfulness, like we do math and science? And I, I will tell you that, again, it's to me, it's a uh, 
we're becoming a little more aware of it, certainly not the way Sue John and I wish. Um, and I'm only speak for a second about Chelmsford. So we've, Chelmsford added a, um, a second health class as a requirement. So we have all freshmen have to take health. And now we have an advanced health, which is ideally designed to deal a little bit more directly with depression, anxiety, um, addiction, those type of things. We'll see how that makes a difference. We also have, um, last year, last couple of years, I've um, done an assembly with juniors and seniors and pretty much talked about some of the things that John and Sue were talking about and talked directly with kids about signs of depression, who to reach out to. So I know some, that's what we're doing in Chelmsford. So I, I can't really speak about some of what may be happening in Westford. But you're raising a good point. And part of what I loved when I first heard John and then tonight, again, broken leg, everybody goes out of their way. Depression, people don't quite know what to do. So we'll, we'll see how, that, uh, how this translates, like I said, in Chelmsford, where we've just started that requirement. So next year, all upperclassmen will have to take a second health class, and it's geared toward these things. We'll see how it works out. Uh, a lot of people who know me, I'm very into mindfulness. Um, and I feel very, very strongly about that. We talk about how to get kids skills. Um, I wish, you know, if people know about DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, which is the type of therapy my daughter is now in, which I think is the best type of therapy because it's, there's four components to it, mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance, and that's the fourth one, um, emotional regulation. And I, I would love to have a DBT class, you know. But the mindfulness piece, I think if we could start so young, I, I, there's curriculum out there. In fact, I did go to, I went to Carrie Cleary, who's the assistant superintendent at one point, um, about the curriculum that they have through Scholastics. And what was very sad to me was I actually reached out to the people in California who, you know, where the program comes from. And for them to come do professional development, the price was prohibitive. And I was really, really disappointed. Um, but that is something that I just feel, incre stress is part of life. You know, I, I think sometimes when we focus on uh, grades, homework, et cetera, I, I, again, we're not focusing on the right things. Um, we need to give kids skills. That's what we need to do. And that's what they are lacking. And that's why I just, I'm gung-ho about mindfulness. Sue and I are hogging it from, from John. Um, just, just another one of the questions, how can we get funding and resources for school teachers and students to get mental health education and support? And I find these questions to be so, so important. And, you know, as I've said, I, I've just been lucky to do 100, 150 talks and love listening to other people. And so it's never my intent to criticize. We, we used to, um, we have these early release days in Chelmsford, so for teachers to get PDPs and nurses and everybody to get training. And five years ago, all, all of these half days became MCAS and curriculum, and I used to present every year to the teachers on depression, on anxiety, recognizing signs, what you can do in the classroom. And so as, as we hope that things are getting better, and one of the people, how do we break that stigma? We also are facing a system, not in just in Chelmsford, where MCAS and all these things start to become more important than the individual and the kid. And unless we change that, we're really barking up the wrong tree. And so you're absolutely right to tr find ways to get funding. And so we get grants. We're lucky, plug to my sister-in-law, Sue Rosa, we get grants. We try to get grants to do talks. We bring people in. We do talks for kids. We, and it's just something that ongoing. It has to continue. Um, and it's not near enough. So we are still trying to do it. I presented um, in Chelmsford again, trying to get us on these early release days to start engaging with teachers again about recognizing these signs. And we'll see what happens. You know, we're all learning. It's not just parents. We're all, all of us up here, we're all learning. I spoke in Cambridge, and I was talking about anxiety and triggers in the school. So I asked this question of the teachers. How many of you, when you're giving a test, and you say to the students, when you're done, bring the test up to my desk? And just about every hand went up. So I asked a couple of teachers who did not have their hand go up, 
why do you not do that? And they say, oh, for my kids who process at a different speed, not slower, at a different speed, as soon as that one kid goes up and hands in, the anxiety is through the roof, all learning is over. The principal of the high school said, wow, when I see kids not in the cafeteria around lunchtime, I'm always pushing them in the cafeteria. Now I realize cafeterias are loud, they're raucous. Can I sit with my friends? Can I get my food? I realize that a lot of those students might have anxiety. I have to look at it differently. And in fact, some school systems in Massachusetts have what they call quiet cafeterias, where you're going in there alone, you're not expected to speak, and you're expected to be quiet. It's so soothing for people who have really an aversion to sounds and all the things that cafeterias are about. I just want to um, quickly also, I got a question about self-generosity. Like, how do you do that? It's damn hard. I struggle with it myself. When I give a presentation and I do this for a living, and it doesn't go well, I torture myself in the car. But we have to say to ourselves over and over, it's okay. And we have to model that behavior, and we have to say to our kids, that's okay. Probably you've had this experience, your child does something wrong, and then they say, they get very upset about it, and they say, do you hate me? We adore them, we love them. We don't maybe like them at that moment, but we adore them. It's okay, we have to say it to ourselves. And beyond that, we have to mean it and we have to live it, even if it feels uncomfortable. Another question here is how can we help with depressed teens, warped thoughts or misperceptions? Counseling. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't say enough about counseling. Um, with Caroline's perceptions, they're real. So you need somebody to work with you on processing it. Um, one of the things that kids with anxiety and depression tend to do too is they tend to over catastrophize and every you know that there's it's always a never for example and and really you need somebody to sit down with you and go through how you're feeling and and walk you through it. Um, like I said, Caroline is 29 almost and she's in counseling still. And I think she will be for the rest of her life because she's still pro working with the way her brain processes information. And there's no shame in needing a counselor. Yeah, uh, that, you know, that's so true. Um, and the other thing is you have to find a good counselor. Yeah. <laughs> Many of you have maybe gone to a counselor and that counselor was not a good match for you. Maybe that person wasn't trained. Also remember what I said before, someone who is anxious, someone who um, is depressed, and if they're talking about suicide, it makes sense to them. When I've had clients say that to me, I say, I know it makes sense to you. I have to be able to acknowledge it. But obviously, there are some other options we have to explore. I, um, one of the wonderful things about working with kids and is when they, when they do open up. And um, I had a, a wonderful young man who people often ask me, because I'm not afraid to work with difficult kids who have had suicide pasts in terms of thinking, action, self-harm. I, I do a lot of that. And I had a wonderful young man from a local area who had overdosed and was very, very ill and in ICU and all that stuff. And I was so angry with him because I love the kids I work with. I love being in Chelmsford, I, I love doing talks, but, and I wasn't sure he was gonna come back to me because everything I do is based on trust. If a kid can't talk to me, then they didn't trust me, which means one, I screwed up, but two, he couldn't trust me, which I was like, I'm never gonna see this kid again. I was very pleased he lived. Six months later, I was very surprised as he was coming out of a varying treatment programs, I get a call, which I had been throughout of his progress, and he asked to come back. And I knew that when he came back, the first thing that I wanted to talk to him about was, are you sure you want to come back to me? I don't understand. Because I said, kids I see don't do this, because they've told me what's happening. And he said, Dan, you don't get it. And I'm looking at him like, you're right, I don't get it. What happened? He said, if I told you, you would have stopped me. I said, that's all it was, it was that simple. At that point, that was the best option. And it was so, I learn something John said that I so respect. I learn every day, every day. And it was so eye-opening for me when this young man said to me, well, it had nothing to do with you, because of course it's always about me. Um, 
he at that point, that's, what, that's where he was at. And so it was very powerful for me. We had a question about uh, addiction to screens and stuff. I want to tell you a story a couple months ago. First of all, when I get into bed, I get on my side of the bed. I'm checking Sports Illustrated, People Magazine, my email, back and forth. My wife is doing the same. We're doing parallel play. So let's first understand it's not just young people. It's all of us. In fact, this has really happened like last year. We're in bed, and I decided I was going to text my wife. She's next to me in bed. And I said, what you doing? She says, I'm in bed. And I say, with who? She said, some guy. I said, you might want to fool around. So we're having this whole conversation back and forth. We're all addicted to screens, and we're all making mistakes, not just young people. Anthony Weiner, remember that guy? He made a couple of mistakes. And by the way, he is incarcerated in Massachusetts. Tyler Clemente was a freshman at Rutgers University who decided he was going to have consensual sex with another man. His roommate made a really poor screen decision and filmed and live streamed that to everyone. Tyler Clemente, the shame was unbearable, jumped to his death off the George Washington Bridge. We have to do a better job screen time. And I'm going to give you the hint. I do a whole workshop. I hate doing it. It's called the Emotional Consequence of Technology. It's a real downer. But here's one tip I will give you. Sunday night, if you have young people in your house, power up their phone their iPad, their laptop, and you give it to them and say, guess what? When the juice is out, you're done for the week. Now you have to monitor, because if it's going out and it's 73%, it can't come back at 90%. Let me tell you what happens. I get emails all the time. And by the way, if you ever want to email me with questions, you can just, I don't, can you just put up the last slide? You can email me. I, I return every email I get. Here's what happens the first week. By Tuesday, your kids will run out of juice, and they'll be saying, you're making it so I'm failing school. It's your fault. By Wednesday of the next week, they'll do a better job. By about the fourth week, they're going to regulate themselves. We have to teach our kids to regulate themselves online. And dopamine means playing a role because it's addictive, too. But we need to not take away stuff. We need to teach them how to use it. And if you try that, email me and let me know your first week will be hell. <laughs> One other, one other question that we got, how do, we get par how do adults, parents of children, talk to them when they're facing the same mental health challenges? And you know, I'll, I'm going to let Sue also talk about this and John, if, but I will tell you that it goes, to me, it goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is honesty, trust. It is so important, I believe, when people share their own stories. And so if you as an adult are having a struggle, it's, it's very powerful for kids to hear those struggles, the challenges you faced, what worked, what didn't. I often end up telling parents of kids who won't go to treatment, you go, model it, show them. Show them good behavior, show them the, that you're going, because John's right. We all adore our kids. I told you, I don't, I don't have parents coming in saying I hate my kid. I do have them coming in saying I don't like what they're doing. But if you can model those good behaviors, you have a much better chance. And it's just a great way to, uh, to show them that you're not only doing it for yourself, but you're going to do it for them. I totally agree. I think, though, as, a, as an adult, as I said earlier, don't ever say you know what they're going through, because it is different. Um, but I, I do think we need to share. <laughs> there has to be more sharing. I'm always amazed even when I, I've, I've always talked openly and I've been fortunate, like I said, because my daughter allowed me to. It's amazing when you start talking about it, how many people will then share their story. Because it's, I call it the dirty little secret. And, and you know, it's when you do open up to your child or to others, um, it is helpful. I, I knew a, a friend who, um, her daughter had an eating disorder, and the teacher told her that she did when she was a young girl. That made a huge difference for that young girl. Yeah, I mean, that's really true. It's interesting how the stigma is so great. But raise your hand if you know someone who suffers with anxiety. Look at that. Look at that. It's amazing. Yet there's a stigma about that. And the same would probably be true for depression. So how odd is that? And if you can be courageous, I can tell you, I'm sure many of you felt this way. I felt so, so moved when Sue spoke. That's so meaningful. It's so compelling. It's so real. 
One of the reasons why parents don't talk to their kids about drinking and drugging and mental health is they're terrified of what their child is going to ask. And my suggestion is this, obviously be age and stage appropriate, always be honest, but when you tell your child, I suffer with anxiety, you're probably confirming what they've known for a long time. If you say, I suffer with depression, they've kind of known that too. The more you can talk about it, the more over a lifetime they'll be able to talk about it and feel like it's okay to ask for help. This question about um, the number of, uh, somebody wrote, I have read that the number of suicides increased after Robin Williams' suicide. Has there been an increase since Kate Spade and Anthony, Anthony Bodine, and how do we prevent it? Um, first of all, there is an absolute myth that if you're not thinking about suicide, talking about it will make you feel suicidal. That's an absolute myth. Um, I do think that there can be contagion suicide. One of the things that really bothered me about Kate Spade, I was very upset because they told, they, in the news, they were talking about how she did it, and I was horrified. I really was. That is so unnecessary. Um, how do we prevent it? Again, we talk to the kids about it. And one of the things that I think parents are very afraid to ask their children, and I was too, have you ever thought of killing yourself? If you have a child who has depression issues, that is a question you should be asking them. And the answer might terrify you, but don't be afraid to ask that. So, you know, the one good thing I feel when, it's terrible what happened, absolutely terrible. The good that comes out of it is for a little while, it becomes a conversation that we're talking more readily about. And it's a shame that it has to, it doesn't occur until something like this happens. And I think when somebody, you know, has a lot of money and a lot of prestige and all that takes their life, it really does make people pause. Because people assume that if you have everything, why would you want to even do that? Because again, they're forgetting that we have no idea what's going on inside the person. All we see is the outside. Awesome. Thank you so much. I was so honored to have this powerhouse panel. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Turn in your evaluations. I'll go collect them now.